welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to ask you to just to remain standing. And I'm going to get down on my knees because I want to instantly get into the word of God. Is that all right with you today? And so as I do, I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God. You need God. So just remain standing. Put our hearts upon the Lord. Now listen closely to what I'm going to say to you. I've said it a million times. I'm going to say it a million more times. Never go to church to hear from a man or woman. We haven't come to hear from an old man, young man, tall man, short man, black man, brown man, white man. We haven't come to hear from a woman. We haven't come, we have come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. When you hear from the Holy Spirit, you'll walk out with something. If you just hear from men, you're going to hear something and then forget it tomorrow. doesn't do you any good. But when you hear from God, it makes all the difference in the world. So your heart needs to be ready. Now it's ready, we've sung, we've come to church, you made the right decisions, you're, you're in line with hearing from the word of the Lord, but let's let the spirit of God be our teacher. So I'm gonna get down my knees, pray, and um, just invite the spirit of the Lord. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We're just so grateful, Father, that we get to come and hear your word, we get to sing your song, get to raise our hearts, our voices, our hands, our lives to you, our souls to you, Lord. We're just so grateful that we know that the Spirit of the Lord is in this house because this is a house, Jesus, that you are the senior pastor of. This is a house that you built by your grace and your love and your mercy. This is a house where you touch the hearts of tens of thousands of people over the years and built them and strengthened them and sent them out and encouraged them. You've done such a wonderful work. We acknowledge that. We give you all the praise and glory. And as you bless us today with your word, may the word of God become alive on the inside of us. We would ask that you bless all the churches that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ all of our brothers and sisters in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Churches. We thank you, Father, for Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, Ecclesia, The Way. We thank you for San Bernardino Temple. We bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours, almighty God, creator of the heavens and the earth. We give you the praise now. Be glorified in this house as well as in your houses everywhere. We're excited about your presence. Jesus' mighty name with a great big shout, we all say. Amen. So good, so good. Go ahead and greet somebody around you, say hi to them, and then go ahead and have a seat. We're happy that you're here. If you're here for the first time, let us greet you. I'm going to take my, my coat off. Oh, thank you. And if you're here for the first time, let us greet you and welcome you and tell you that we love you a whole lot. We're happy that you're here. Maybe you've never been at the Rock Church World Outreach Center before. We have a little pamphlet brochure that we want to hand to you. It only takes a moment to get it into your hands. Is that okay? But you got to raise your hand if you're here for the first time so they can spot where you're at. So there's some folks right back over here, some folks back. Just get your hand up right back there, back there, back there, back there, back over there, back over there, back there. God bless you. Over there. God bless you. Back up on top, back there, back there. All the way on top. Hey, man, good to see you. God bless you. Back over there, back there. Let's give them a better warm welcome than that. <laughs> Inside, there's a general information card. You can tear it off and, and put your name, telephone number on there and drop it in the offering basket when it goes by later on in the service. But, you know, that's not the best thing to do with that. The best thing to do is to get that name and telephone number on that 
little general information card. Meet us at the right-hand side of the foyer. The pastors will be over there. They want to meet you. Um, usually between every service, I'm there. But after the second service, because um, I don't need to tell you this, but I'll tell you anyway. I run off the stage and go lay down and take a nap so I can preach the third service, you know? At my age, I can do that. Is that okay? I mean, it's, it's pretty good that I'm waiting until the third service to take a nap. And as I get older, I'll be taking a nap before the first service. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, uh, so I won't meet you there after church, but the rest of the pastors will be there. Bring that little general information card, and they'll give you free CD of today's message. I'll give you whatever you want. Pizza, lobster steak, whatever. Just bring it over there. And, um, and we just want you to know we love you a whole lot. Hey, have you got one of these? If you didn't get this, this is yours. We had this printed for you. Everybody, not just somebody, everybody should have this. And this is really a cool brochure telling you about our freedom for our future campaigns, capital stewardship campaign, which means we're learning how to take the finances that God gives us, listen to this, and learning how to manage it well. We found out some important things, one of which is the, how well you manage what God gives you determines on how much God's going to give you. That's as simple as that. If you don't manage it, and by the way, managing it isn't your management, it's his management. So you can manage it really great your way, and still be wrong. <laughs> you got to manage it his way. That's what this is what, all about. And how great you manage it determines how much you get. We found that out from part number one. So right after church service, get this. Inside, there's all kinds of notes, paper, that you can make notes on all the different messages. Now, uh, part number one is really cool. Part number two is even better. This is part number three. If you didn't get part number one, and didn't get part number two, I'll give it to you. I'll give you the free CD on it. Because we want you to get this. This is very important for your financial future. This is God's economic recovery plan for mankind. That ought to attract you. So to concentrate a little bit. God's economic recovery plan for your future and for your life. We're looking at what the Word of God has to say, the priorities of the Word of God. Remember this, before we get into today's message, there was such a priority of over 2,350 times God speaks about finances in the Old Testament and New Testament. That's amazing that many times. So God must obviously care about it. When love, which is so important, is only spoken of 650 times. So here we're going to be looking at the word of the Lord. It's very, very important for us to see it. Let me just take you a moment to review just for a few moments. Then we'll get into the word of God. I'm only taking you to maybe seven verses today. So it's really kind of cool. I'll explain the seven verses. Number one, part number one. Remember, we found out that oftentimes our heartstrings are attached to our wallets, what we have, material things. When in fact, God gives us everything. God cannot allow the fact that your God becomes your money. In fact, he makes it very clear that you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve two gods. Makes it very clear. The word mammon means financial contributions that God has given you. God's given you everything. God has everything. Everything you have, you got from God. And you cannot serve the stuff. And stop thinking about how much control money has. It tells us when we go, where we go, how we go. It tells us what kind of vacation we're on. It tells us what you can eat, what you can't eat. I mean, it's a, it, according to the scripture, it is a God that controls us. And God doesn't want that which is in your wallet or your bank account to control you. He wants, he wants to control you. And therefore, it gives you outlines on how to break free and how to be free in their financial uh, situations for the future. So it's very important for us because he makes a very clear statement. Remember in part number one, where your heart is, is that's where your treasure is. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's at. So whatever you put an importance on is what this is really all about. Are you, are you following me? We found out also that people have a tendency to give God the bottom of the dredge, whatever's left over. Just like the children of Israel we saw that in Malachi, the first chapter. You remember that? They came, they gave the broken, the sick, the lame sheep in their offerings. They didn't give the very best. 
They held the very best for themselves. We have a tendency to do that. When you hold that which belongs to God and use it for yourself, let me say it again. When you hold that which belongs to God and use it for yourself, one more time. When you hold that which belongs to God and use it for yourself, the Bible said, part number two, that it's robbery, that you personally are robbing from God. And then the Bible said you curse yourself with a curse. Wow, that's shocking. Nobody can curse you because you're blessed by the Spirit of God. But you can curse yourself by doing the wrong things. Doing the wrong things, ending up at the wrong place, ending up at the wrong place, ends up bad decisions, bad decisions end up cursed in whatever you're doing. So nobody can curse you, but you can curse yourself by doing the wrong things. You follow me, found that out in part number two. But God says something fascinating in part number two. He says, test me, try me. It's the only place in the Bible, the only place that I can find, maybe you can find something else, but I can't find anything, where God says to humans, humans, you now can test me. The creator of the heavens and the earth can now be tested by God in the area of their tithe and their offerings. The word tithe means 10%, doesn't mean just giving. That means whatever God gives you, you set it aside 10% and give it back to God for the building of the kingdom of God. Offering means you, whatever it is, it's over and above your tithe. And it belongs in the storehouse, belongs in the word of God, it belongs in the house of God, that there might always be nourishment for God's people in the house of God. That's the right way to place it. Whether you like it or not, that's what God says and that's the way it is. This is not about you do what you want because you feel this is the right way. It's not about our feelings. It's about what God says and us being obedient to what God says. Even though our feelings and our ideologies and philosophies want to take us some other place other than where God wants us to be. And that's called obedience. And so we find ourselves oftentimes not being very obedient. When God says, test me, see if I won't do something. And he says three things. I mean, God could have said, just do what I tell you to do. I'm God, creator of the heavens and the earth. If you don't, I'm going to have a giant wave come over the wall and crush you. But he doesn't. He doesn't say that at all. What God says, listen, test me, put me to the test, see if I won't return to you in such a way, number one, the first promise he says, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing you won't be able to handle it. I mean, that is amazing, such a blessing. The second thing he promises to us, he says, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. They will not come in and rebuke that which you have done. They will not take from you what you have. Sometimes people live like they have, they get their paycheck, and their paycheck's in a bag with holes in it. And before they even get that bag home, it's gone. And guess what? That's a cursing in yourself. That's a miserable situation to be in. You don't want to be in that way. God says, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. Can I tell you something? I don't care how great a Christian you are. I don't care if you preach the gospel, finish seminary, have a great church and everything else. You will always be under the pressure of the devil wanting to stop you at every turn of the road. Always. You're always going to have the devourer there. But Jesus said, I've come to give you what? Life and give it how more abundantly. But it doesn't just happen because you're pretty and smart, talented, and gifted. It happens because you are obedient to the things of God. We're learning how to be obedient to the things of God. Third thing he promises is test me. Not only will I open up the windows of heaven and rebuke the devourer for your sake, but guess what? Your blessings will be so obvious that the nations around you will spot you and call you blessed. Oh, wow. In other words, you're going to be so blessed that you won't be hidden. You'll be something that's an example to other people. That's amazing to me. That was in part number two. We had a great time there. Part number three is wild. Someone might say to me, listen, Pastor, I hear what you say. But I'm a real logical person. How is all of that going to happen? How is it going to work? It doesn't make sense to me. Here's how. I want to answer that for you and show it to you today. How it's going to work. Anybody ever wondered how it's going to work? How does giving God the finances that he requests from us to put to work in the ministry, how in the world does it return more finances back to me? That like doesn't make sense. And I, before I do anything, I'm a real logical person. I got to know how it's going to work. Here's how it's going to work. Are you ready? Yeah. Miracle. When you take the word miracle out of God, you have no God. God is a God of miracle in anything, listen to this, that you can figure out how it works will never be a miracle. 
And God wants to work a miracle on your part. God wants to take a nothing, make something out of it. God wants to take that dead, make it alive. He's a miracle working God. God raises the dead, opens the blind eyes. God's a great and mighty God. He's a creator of the heavens and the earth. And when he speaks, the atmospheres come to life and the planets start to exist. Why? Because he is a miracle working God. And so many people want to take this miracle working God and put him in a box of logic. Human logic, not even godly logic, human logic doesn't work. So I'm going to read you a story. I'm going to read seven verses in this story to you out of 2 Kings. Go there with me. These seven verses I'm going to read, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to explain what's going on so that you can understand. Please keep in mind this. Would you do that? that everything in the Old Testament is examples in the natural of what spiritually God wants to do in the New Testament. We look at the failures of the people in the Old Testament so we don't fail today. Why? Because we have a tendency to do the same things they did. We look at the success of the people in the Old Testament and know that, wow, they were successful doing that. We can do that too and be successful. So God tells us a lot by looking at the scripture. Now, my assumption, and this is a great assumption, is that you believe the word of God. If you don't believe the word of God, you might as well get up right now and leave and go find some screwed up church that won't teach you the word of God. But I believe the word of God is the infallible inspired word of God that's been around for thousands of years. And my assumption, if you're here listening to me, you're believing that that's what God said. That settles it. That's the way it is. It may, let me, let me give it to you in San Bernardino language. It may not be, listen to this, it may not fit with your feelings, but it is what God says and it's right. Is anybody listening? <laughs> so let's talk. Verse number one. I'm going to read it to you, come back and explain to you. A certain woman of the wives of the son of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that the servant feared, your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be slaves. Verse number two. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil, verse number three. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all of your neighbors. Empty the vessels and do not gather just a few, verse number four. And when they had come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons and then pour it into all of the vessels and set aside the full ones. Verse number five. And so when she, from, so when she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought her the vessels to her, she poured it out, verse number six. And it came to pass that when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. And she came to the man of God and he said, go and sell the oil and pay your debt. And you and your sons will live on the rest. Now, these seven verses are here for a reason, because they talk, listen to this, about you and they talk about me. And from her life, we can learn something about ourselves, about our God, about our activities, about our answers, about our way. And may I say this about our financial futures. So let's take a look at it together. Verse number one, let's go back and let me explain it to you. Verse number one, a stop right here, a certain woman. This is not just anybody that's off the street. She is very special before God. Her name is not even mentioned because it's not important that you know the name. But there's a special attachment to her and God for a reason, and you'll see it in just a moment. A certain woman who was, and here's what she was, 
of the wives of the sons of the prophets. Stop right there. Of the wives of the sons of the prophet. Wives of the sons of the prophet. In other words, her, there was sons of the prophets. They were like, if you will, servants. They were like, if you will, the, um, how would you put them? The, uh, the one who took care of the prophet, who took care of his needs and followed him and, and helped him and built him and encouraged him. He was the one that, that cooked for him. They were the one that were his servants. They were his, uh, uh, some form of attache that would take care of the prophet. He was called the sons of the prophet. And she was a wife of one of these guys. Follow me? And he makes this statement, the wives of the son of the prophets, and she cries out to Elisha. The word Elisha means something. It's not just prophet. You see, in those days, they didn't have a leather-bound book of the Word of God. There was no place for them to go find out what God said. In order for them to find out what God said, they had to go to the prophet, or the prophet came to the community and told the community what the Word of God is saying. So the first thing you see about this woman is she's very unique. She's a wife of somebody who was a servant to the prophet and she comes after the prophet. Now she could do other things. She could maybe talk to her aunt. She could maybe now in a time of trouble talk to her relatives. Maybe she could borrow money from her grandmother. She could do maybe take out a credit card. She could call American Express maybe. She could do something. Maybe she could start a new account. She could go to the bank, maybe borrow money. She's under pressure. Guess what? Under financial pressure. Instead of that, listen to what the woman does. She goes after the word of God. He represent not just a man of God, not just a prophet. He was the living, speaking word of God that carried the message from God to the people. She knew where to go. She knew what to require of him. She knew what to say. She knew who to go after. She didn't just go anywhere. And oftentimes, we'll go somewhere to answer our questions and answer our problems instead of the things of God. And we want to be blessed, but we find ourselves in a place of going after something different than God. And when you go after something different than God, you'll get results that are different than God's. It's true, somebody say. Man, that's so true. And the last part of that verse comes along. And she makes this statement that's so powerful. She says, your servant... My husband, notice he's a servant of the prophet. My husband, she probably didn't have much, if any, relationship with Elisha herself. In those days, everything went through the man. And it says, your servant, my husband, is dead. See the word dead? You ought to circle it in your Bible. The word dead means gone. Over with. Life is finished. No more can count on him. Hadios amigos. Bye. Out of the scene. No longer active. No longer can draw from him. No longer can do anything. He is not contributing one stinking thing from now on. The dude is dead. And she goes on to say to the word of God, to this man of God who speaks the word of God, this prophet of God, you know, he knows something. That your servant, notice this next word, feared the Lord. Can I tell you something? When God says someone feared the Lord, did they just partially fear the Lord? Did they just have a lukewarm relationship with God? Did they kind of do their own thing and then a little bit of God's thing and, you know, they had an occasional relationship with God? Or do you believe that when God said the man feared the Lord, 
That means in every area of his life, he was committed. He was committed to the servant. He was committed to the man of God. He was committed to the word of God. Don't think for a moment he didn't bring his tithe and his offering into the temple because if he didn't bring his tithe and offering into the temple, he couldn't work for the man of God. He would be an abomination to the man of God. The man of God couldn't have that. He needed to hear clearly from God and he couldn't have somebody work for him and be close to him. That was an abomination to God or he would never hear the voice of the Lord. It was very important that this man feared the Lord. He did everything as clearly and as precise as was spoken in the word of God. So when she makes that statement, she's saying something about her dead husband. You know he was a man of God in every area. And then she says, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. If you have debt, you have children, your children go into bondage until the debt's paid off. How many years? Could be a lot of years. How horrible. I would think that probably one of the worst things a mom could ever have in her life is have her children in bondage in some form of slavery, incarcerated from freedom. How horrible. She goes with this problem to the man of God. The man of God makes a statement. In verse number two, let's see what he says. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me. In other words, he just, what shall I do? She obviously doesn't answer, so he says, tell me. What do you have in your house? Isn't it interesting that the actions of the man of God and God is now dependent on what's inside the house. What have you got in your house? See, a lot of times we don't realize how much we have in our houses. Got old boats sitting around, got old cars, got old junk uh, motorcycles, got all kinds of stuff. In fact, uh, like last Wednesday night, Pastor Paul said, this is the only country in the world that has storage units. And one of our favorite television shows is, you know it, Storage Wars. <laughs> I saw one where a guy in Victorville bought a $400 storage Inside was an old Triumph Motorcycles and it was Elvis Presley's. Talk about cool. A lot of times we don't realize, we say we don't have anything, but we have a lot in the house. He's not letting her get away with that. What have you got in the house? And she says, well, your maid service, let's stop right there. Maid servant means, listen, I'm a woman. I don't have anything. My husband's dead. They're coming to get my kids. My husband served the Lord, but they're coming to get my kids. I don't have anything. Thank God she didn't stop right there and think of herself with nothing. Because most people, when you ask them what they have, you know what they say? I haven't got anything. When in fact they have something of value. And then she says, I have nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Jar of oil. The only value this woman had. Isn't it interesting? She didn't say she had a lot. She didn't say she had some other things. You know, she didn't say, well, I've got a flat screen. I've got this. I've got that. I've got uh, couches. I've got, I've got this. I, you know, I've got all these kinds of cooking. So, uh, no, I, 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 I just have a jar. In other words, God takes it to the very minimum. In our thinking, this woman really does have nothing. What's a jar of oil? Fascinating. Prophet of God speaks. Verse number three. 
Let's check it out. And then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere. From all the neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. He warns her, go borrow vessels from everywhere. I want you to know something. So oftentimes when God tells you to do something, it's embarrassing. It's not comfortable. It's certainly not easy. Oh, we'll do it if it's easy. We'll do it if it fits in our schedule. We'll do it if we can understand it. We'll do it if it, uh, you know, it's rational. We'll do it if we can figure it out. But here God says to her, what have you got? She says, a jar of oil. And he says, I want you to go to all your neighbors, and I don't want you just to borrow a few. I want you to get a whole bunch of vessels, uh, get as many as you can, get a lot of them. What would I do if I was in that place? I'd say, why? Are you lost your mind? What in the world's that got to do with me paying the bills? What's that got to do with my kids being toted off in a couple of hours into slavery for the rest of their life? What in the world's that got to do with it? Anyway, it's embarrassing to go to people and let them know where I feel and where they are, I'm at. And this is a horrible thing. I, I, I would question it, and I wouldn't do it, and so would you. You know why? Because God oftentimes asks us to do things that don't fit with our logic and is embarrassing to our situation, but that is the very thing that stimulates a miracle. And we miss it. If we can figure it out, it's not a miracle. So when God asks you to do something that's weird, do it. Because it's in that weird thing that God asked you to do that brings about something you don't know how it's going to come about. And it's called a miracle. So she could have easily said, what are you doing, man? You lost your mind. I'm not putting my kids, I'm not going to my neighbors. I already have enough trouble. They're already snoopy enough. They're already asking me all the time about it. They're, they're gossiping about me constantly. Now you want me to go to them and do something, borrow from them? Let's see what happens. And he says these words, verse number four. And when you have come in, so she goes out gets these things. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. You ever wondered why he wants the door shut behind her? In fact, the next verse says it again. Shutting the door shut out the neighbors that were snooping. You will always have people looking at you, talking about you, criticizing you, judging you, saying you're stupid, saying you're an idiot, trying to get you to be a person they can gossip about. So he says, listen, don't let those kind of negative people in your life shut the door on them. And there's a few of us in here that when God tells us to do something that sounds just flat crazy, we need to shut the door on all the people's opinions that say that you can't do it. It's not going to work. If God said it, it's going to work. So he says, shut the door. Shutting the door, shut them out. And he says, then pour it into all of the vessels. Did you notice that little jar of oil now is called an it? Didn't say pour the jar of oil. He calls the jar of oil it. That's interesting. How many it's have we got in our houses? I can't do anything. I don't have anything. I don't know how I'm going to make it. You got a lot of it's in those vessels and set aside the full ones, verse number five. And so she went from him, listen to this, shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Verse six, now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil stopped, ceased. Don't you wish she had gotten more vessels? Do you think she looked at her boys and said, 
We should have gotten more vessels. You know she did. You know the Joneses down the street, they had a couple of big barrels. We didn't take those. We should have taken those. You know, isn't it true that whatever's in your heart that you will do, it's God's heart in the same manner will do for you. In other words, isn't it true from the last time we were together that you call the shots either with a spoon or the shovel? We want shovel results, but we're doing spoon action. Don't you know she wishes she had gotten more vessels? Don't ever sell God short. Watch this. Verse number seven, last verse. Then she came and she told the man of God. And he said, go and sell the oil and pay your debt. And you and your sons live on the rest. I don't know if you ever thought about this or not, but she takes the value of the oil that's in those vessels and sells it, pays the debt off. The kids are free. Boy, don't you know she had to rejoice. That in itself is a miracle and that in itself is good enough but it doesn't stop there. He says to her, you and your sons live on the rest. I don't know if you thought about that. Maybe you're one of those people that say, how long did she live on the rest? As long as she was alive. Didn't say live on the rest for 10 minutes. Didn't say live on the rest for an hour or, you know, until the oil runs out. It says live on the rest. That means as long as I'm alive, the rest is going to be there to help finance me. Are you following that? I mean, we're talking about a family going from poverty into slavery, from slavery immediately to economic recovery, all because... There's some players that are magnificent. Let's see if we can learn something. First of all, you gotta admit she was pretty obedient. Secondly, you gotta admit she goes after the right source, the word of God. Thirdly, you gotta understand when he said to do something that's crazy, she wasn't afraid of it. We're learning that. What a lesson that is. Sure, it's embarrassing, but God would have us to do that. Fourthly, she involved her kids in it. Kids are learning something. Pretty cool. Obviously, the power of the Word of God supersedes the natural world that she lived in. That's a pretty good lesson in itself, don't you think? Did anybody learn anything from that? Wait a minute. But that's not the lesson of the story. The lesson of the story is not in the man of God. The lesson of the story is not in the woman, the mother. The lesson of the story is not in the sons. The lesson of the story is not in the oil. Do you know where the lesson of the story is? It's in the dead man. That God even keeps his promises to those that will serve him even after they're gone from the planet from generation to generation to generation to generation. And the dead man speaks from his grave to every one of us that are in here today. My God, you know what just was said? This is not about you and the here and now when you make a decision to give to God or not give to God. It's about you here and now, but it's also about the kids and the kids' kids that follow you because guess what? If blessings can go to generations, then cursings can go to generations. In other words, ask yourself this. If the man didn't serve God with his tithe, his offering, his heart, following the word, being a servant of the word, 
which the man of God brought. Here's the question. Where would his children have ended up? Even if he got by in this life right now, then his kids will pay the price for his disobedience. And that's a shock, my friends. We can play games with God all we want. This is not a game. There's more at stake. Now, if you're a single mom, then you're the head of the family. Then you're responsible spiritually for doing what is right before God so that God remembers what you have done. And when your kids are getting ready to get trapped, the Bible says he will do what? Remember that? Rebuke the devourer for your sake. And that's exactly what he has done. This is not just about you today. This is about your kids' kids. Because if blessings can go to my children's children, then cursings can go to my... And he says, you have cursed yourself with a curse. Cursings go to my children's children because I'm disobedient they God forgive us they fail what you sow you even after death yeah. is that wild the proof of that's Jesus is that wild in Deuteronomy now watch this Eighth chapter, verse 18. You shall remember the Lord your God is he who gives you the power to get money. Doesn't say that. Way beyond money. Listen to the word he uses. The word here is wealth. If he was talking about money, that'd be pretty good. I'd like that. But he goes way beyond money. God makes a promise. He says, he gives you the power, listen to this, to get not just money, wealth. What for? That he may establish. Everybody say establish. establish. Now everybody say establish. 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 Listen to this. His covenant. Can I ask you something? In the heart of those boys that lived off of the oil that mother got in those vessels for the rest of their life, do you think the covenant of God was established in them? You better believe it. Do you think the covenant of God right now, when God prospered that little widow woman and her two boys, do you think he prospered her just to prosper her? Or he would know that you studied the story and the covenant of God would be adhered to in your heart. Some of your hearts now, it's being established right now that the promises of God, and it all came from that little widow woman. And which he swore to your father's generation, watch this, as it is to this day. This is all about the future, not just about the here and now. And we have no idea what we're doing, who we're tying up, who we're putting in bondage, who we are destroying because of our faith today. I want you to hear a story. I want you to see it. I'm going to play a video for you. And I want you to see the mom and her child. And I want you to see the difference between someone who's cursed and someone who's blessed. Listen and watch. When Pastor Jim told the church, I remember the service when he made the announcement that we were going to be building a new and bigger church. And they were asking, he was explained about that they were going to be asking for building pledges to fund the construction of the project. When he asked if you wanted to make a pledge to raise your hand to get a card, a pledge card. I, and Brian said to me, I want to. And I thought, well, he doesn't understand what he's talking about. So shh, shh, shh. I shushed him down, you know, like shh, shh. 
And he said, I want to. And before I could actually shush him again, um, the Holy Spirit just quickened my heart. And the message I got, well, it's not your place to determine or decide what he understands. And so I said, okay, you can, I'll let him take a card. And we talked about it at home later, like I said, and he was excited to give. And after we gave the, when the pledge was due, like I said, and he gave us, gave the pledge. And I just put a little note in there about the fact that he was Down syndrome and he loved the church and this was his pledge. And like I said, it was not a large amount, but I never ever dreamed that, you know, what would happen after that. And Pastor Jim made the announcement um, that we would have a class in our new church when it was built called Brian's Class for Special Needs. I'm thankful that, that I didn't shush him again because not just us, but a lot of families, a lot, a lot of would have missed out on the blessing that that class brings to, to families. He loves to give an offering, loves to give an offering. When his grandmother sent him a $5 bill and a birthday card and he does like money, so he was excited. Oh, wow, this has really made his, <laughs> made his day. But when we were in church the following Sunday, I think he had a few more coins or something in his pocket, but that $5 bill came out, right in the offering it went. And it touched my heart because I thought, if he can be that free hearted to give something that it meant a lot to him, I know it did, because he likes to go to Kuka's and he likes to buy nachos and things like that, but, but he put that money in the offering. If he's got a quarter or pennies or whatever, and it was just that willingness, that those little words, I want to. And I think that's where the key is, I want to. And if a person wants to and you're willing, that, that little seed of faith will go further than you could ever hope. I love The Rock. I love the fact that it loves and places value on every single soul. The Rock Church is a very, very, very worthy place for our um, pledges, for our offerings. It's, it's, it's just met the needs of so many people's lives. If he, if he quickens your heart to do something, I'd say be quick to obey. He can bless and he will bless more than you could ever, ever, ever think or imagine. For generations to come, that family will be blessed. In case you didn't know it, Chris said that he didn't give very much. Let me tell you the truth. He gave the largest gift I have ever received in 35 years of ministry. It wasn't in the amount. It was in the heart that changed our church. And I will go to my grave remembering Brian's gift that made this church and makes it what it is, the sacrifice of someone. Don't think for a moment God hasn't seen that. Don't think for a moment that God isn't just standing by ready to do a miracle. Don't think for a moment that God will forget you. Even the dead, he remembers their works. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. I'll let you go in just a moment. Nothing could be worse in your life than coming in the house of God, hearing a message like you just heard. It stunned you. It's so stunning. Did you notice how quiet you all were? Stunning is what it is. singing, clapping our hands, hearing the word of God, leaving here, going to your car and your heart stops and you die and go to hell. Nothing could be worse. I want to make sure you're not going to go to hell, but that you're going to go to heaven. You don't go to heaven because you think you can make it. You don't go to heaven because you're a nice person or a good person. You don't get to go to heaven your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Listen to this. No man goes to the Father, in other words, goes to heaven, except by me. You've got to get there his way. And he tells us exactly how to get to heaven. Your mom and dad can't pronounce you a Christian, make you a Christian, and you go to heaven. Have you christened or baptized as a baby? You get to go to heaven. No way. It's not in the Bible. 
You can't join a church makes you a Christian. You can't go to seminary and preach for 100 years and now you're a Christian. No, it's all about the heart. Jesus said it like this, you must be born again. When I say those words to American churches, born again, most people don't understand what I mean. And they don't like the words born again, but born again is simple. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been, it always will be. All or nothing. Last book in the Bible, Jesus said these words, I'm coming again and you know he is. And he says, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll, I'll vomit you from my mouth. That's what Jesus said. What did he really just say is that lukewarm people that call themselves Christians are not real Christians at all and they're gonna get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. I don't want you to miss this. Lukewarm, what's it mean? A little in, a little out. Let's define lukewarm, a little up, a little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. That's lukewarm. How about this? You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. That's lukewarm. You know a lot of people that way that call themselves Christians that are not gonna make it. Today is your day of salvation. God brought you here for a reason. That's what this is all about. He cares about you and loves you. And today you can start fresh with God by giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life. You gotta give it to him. Nobody can make you do it. He's not gonna hit you in the head with a two by four, make you give your heart and life. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it or a manipulator to make you do it. He could do it if you know. He could make you do it, but he doesn't gives you the free will choice. It's your call, it's your choice to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. Tonight, today in this house, safe and friendly place is your day of salvation. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do it? How do I give God all of my heart? How do I give God all of my life? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. You sit there and do nothing, it's going to get you nothing. But if you do something, God will see it. He said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man. In a moment, I'll count to three, I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up and I'll see your hand go up. When your hand goes up, what you're saying is I want to give all of my heart and life to Jesus Christ, be born again, headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. He said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. He says, I'll confess you as mine before my father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are not sure, make sure. Today is your day of salvation. Today is your day. Don't let anything disturb you back in that section. I'm talking to some of you that are in there right now. Don't let anything stop you. Today is your day of salvation. I'm going to count to three. If you've been running from God, like I said, You've never given him all of your heart, never given him all of your life. Like I said, get ready to put your hand up. If you're not sure, make sure. Today is your day. I'm counting, here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, thank you, there's two, thank you, there's three, four, five, thank you, there's six back over here, God bless you. Anybody else, there's seven, thank you. Anybody else, real quick, there's eight back here, God bless you, there's eight wise people. Anybody else, real quick, you know you need to get your hand up and get right with God. There's eight people, I know there's more than eight in here right now. Anybody else, real quick, anybody else? Anybody else, there's nine, 10, 11, thank you. There's, there's somebody else back over on this side. You're pointing over here, but I don't know where you're pointing. There's 11. There's another one up top, 12. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 11. 
Here's what I want you to do real quick, because we don't have much time. All 11 of you, I want you to get your stuff. Get all of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. If you're serious about God, and anybody that should have raised your hand, but you didn't, I want you to get out of your seat and get up here in front real quick. All 11 of you, let's stand welcome. Nobody leave during this period of time. Let the people come. But you've got to come fast. Come on, hurry. Hurry, 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 hurry. Get your stuff. Get up here. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I belong. Hurry, hurry, hurry. To the reason that I live. The reason that I live. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Jesus, I believe. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Hurry, come on. Jesus, I believe. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. They're still coming, they're still coming. You come too, come on, hurry. Thank God, thank God, thank God you guys have come. Real quick, I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel. He's gonna pray with you, give you some free stuff about what to do next, and then tell you about a program we have called Spiritual personal trainers. Only takes a few moments of your time. The people you came with, they'll wait for you. Make a left turn. Follow Joel right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs>